Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're gonna do the actual brew of our premium homebrew kit that More Beer sent. Uh, so we're doing an American ale and let's just get right into it. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is add three gallons of water to this. That's half the water that we're gonna use for our five gallon batch. Usually you're gonna want about five and a half gallons in the fermenter because you lose a bit of liquid just because things settle to the bottom. So there's trube in the bottom that is basically just like protein from the malt and hop crud and just yeast. So that'll take up about half a gallon of your volume. So we want to actually make five gallons so that we can make 48 bottles of beer. And I'm just gonna use my filtered tap water. I run it through a pure filter. If you don't have a problem with like chlorine or if your water doesn't smell like a pool, like you should be fine with just using your regular old tap water. I know like up in Washington, it's not a problem to use just out of the sink tap water, but I'm in Los Angeles, so we have a lot of chlorine in our water supply. So I'm just gonna throw in three gallons. There's measurements on the side of this, but if you don't have a kettle that has markings on it, one trick you can do is, so you're gonna grab yourself a gallon jug of some sort, just anything that lets you know exactly how much you're putting in it. So you can also use like mason jars. I have a bunch of quart mason jars, so you could use four of those if you wanted. And then for every gallon you put in, you take two little magnets, you put one on the inside, one on the outside, exactly where your gallon marking is. And then you can move it as you fill it. So then once you have your gallon jug, you can put in one gallon at a time, mark it with like nail polish or something that'll stick. Um, Sharpies don't work great because you're washing it so much, but nail polish is great. And then you'll have a good idea of how much volume you have in your kettle. I actually really love this idea because a lot of times if you're using cheaper kettles or like, um, I recommend a turkey fryer kit uh, a lot of the times for people who are getting into homebrew and they typically don't have the measurements on it. So it's super easy to just use a couple magnets and these cost like a dollar. All right, anyway, so I have some water. I'm gonna just toss it in. This thing holds about a gallon. So I'm just gonna go one at a time. Okay, so now that we've got our three gallons of water in there, we are going to put our steeping grains in. So if you got an extract kit, it's the grains that still look like grains, basically. So we've got one pound of Great Western Crystal, 15 Lava Bonds. So this is a grain where the sugars are already available because of the way it was kilned and it was basically already cooked. Um, so this is gonna give us a nice like color and some sweetness. And we're gonna put it in one of these mesh bags and we're gonna let it sit into this kettle until we reach 170 degrees, probably about 30 minutes. Um, they suggest putting it in for 30 minutes no matter what. So if we reach 170 degrees first, we will just cut it and let it sit and steep a little bit longer. So I'm gonna toss this in. Do it over your kettle because there's small parts and it might fall in. So don't, don't just pour these into your kettle. It'll be a big mess and you don't wanna do it. I've done it before, it's a bad idea. We're only doing this step because we're not doing a mash. So typically if you were doing a full grain version, you would do this with your um, base malts. So base malts you have to mash to get the sugars from the malts, but these specialty malts you don't. 
So I'm just gonna get them all wet in there. You're gonna see the colors already changing and I just like to tie this bag to the handle. Just to make sure it doesn't leak green anywhere. Okay, so I'm gonna turn on my stove. And you're gonna wanna leave that on high because it's gonna take a minute. Okay, so I've got my thermometer here. So my thermometer is not calibrated. So I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. So this works best with crushed ice, but I'm in an apartment with a really crappy fridge and don't have that ability. I'm gonna try to smash this up a bit though in a plastic bag. Okay, so basically you just want a really, really, really cold glass of water. It's gonna need to be essentially freezing, which is why we crushed the ice. So you're gonna just let that sit basically until some of the ice melts and it stops melting for a bit and don't put it next to your kettle because that'll be very hot. All right, so we're gonna try to use this guy. So how you calibrate a thermometer is you basically have ice cold water, you stick your thermometer in, you know if it's ice cold, you're hitting zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's basically what you're looking for and if it doesn't, you need to change it. So how you do it on this one is you just spin it, which is really dumb because anytime you tweak it, it screws it up. Typically there will be a little nut on it that you can turn. Sure, we're gonna call that good. So our water is at around 90 degrees right now. It's got some time left on it. So I will meet you guys back here when we're ready to pull the grains out and then we can put in our liquid malt extract. Okay, so we're almost at our 170 degrees. I just wanted to show you guys this recipe sheet. So this is where we're gonna keep track of what our original gravity was. So you need an original gravity and a final gravity to figure out what your uh, alcohol percentage is, so ABV. Um, this also has some information like the IBUs present. That's just how bitter it is from the hops. Um, our estimated ABV is between four and a half to 5%. Our estimated original gravity is 1.044 to 1.05. And our final gravity doesn't say. So it's important to actually write down what your original gravity is uh, when you take it uh, with your hydrometer. Well, I'll show you guys how to do that in a second once we're done. And it's important because you never know, like I uh, typically will make beers stronger than I intend to. So it's just nice to know what you're getting yourself into when you're drinking it. If you're wondering if, is my apartment too small to brew beer? My kitchen is all of, it's not even a hundred square feet. It's about 60 square feet. Um, so I have approximately three feet from one countertop to the other and about seven feet wide. So this is, I think, probably one of the smallest kitchens in the world. Um, it's an old building built in the 40s. So uh, they didn't think about large open kitchens like we like now. So, you know, as long as you've got a stove top, or some outdoor space, you can brew. It's really, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to have a whole garage brewery or a whole room like I have now. You will want it in the future because you end up accumulating things and need some space for them like I have. I have a whole room and yet I still have things in the garage. All right, so we're at our 170 degrees. I'm gonna kill my heat and I'm gonna pull my grain out. I just attached my thermometer to that. So we're gonna let it just drain. Don't squeeze it. There's no reason to. And there's, there's two minds about this. So there's a whole thing called brew in a bag. And that's when you basically mash in a bag. There's been some studies done um, about if squeezing the bag with the grain in it really affects the flavor or not. Typically it'll affect the color a bit, but flavor wise, not a ton, not enough to 
not worry about it. In this situation, you don't have to worry about getting all of the sugars out because that's what the liquid malt extract is for. That's like the basis of all of our sugars. So we're gonna stir that in now. We've got seven pounds of ultralight malt extract and I'm just gonna go grab my mash paddle and do it. Also, I just want you guys to know this is the first mash paddle I've owned. I typically use a slotted spoon, but this will work way better. Okay, so our temperature is off. I'm gonna open this up and stir it in. We're gonna make sure it's completely dissolved. The reason you don't wanna have your heat on is because if the extract goes all the way to the bottom and sits there, it can burn. So you need to not have a heat source on until it's fully dissolved. And this goes for dried malt extract as well. Ooh. I usually use dried malt extract because liquid malt extract is really bizarre. So it's basically just syrup. We're gonna make sure we get all the goodness out of there. So if anyone has had um, malt flavored ice cream, I've had it at, I think, Salt and Straw, and I think also Tillamook makes one. Um, that is basically what this tastes like. It's very sweet, it's a little caramely, but it's got a very distinctive grain flavor. It's really nice. If you get your grains, taste them. It's They don't taste bad, A. Eh? How would they taste bad? They're making your beer, which tastes great. Um, typically they're sweeter than uh, beer is um, because you know, it's the pre-alcoholed beer. And especially when you get into specialty grains, there's so many flavors that you can get out of it. I There's this one malt that I really love, Carafa, and it tastes like um, sourdough, like a burnt sourdough piece of toast and I love it. It's amazing and it makes the thickest black beers you've ever seen. I'm really trying really hard not to get this on myself. It's gonna happen. I'm just literally trying to get every drop out of this. So one of the reasons people don't just um, do extract is, you. I mean, you can get a lot of different kinds of extracts. So you can pretty much make any beer with extract, but it gets expensive. So when you're making a batch of all grain beer, it's about $30 to make a five gallon batch. When you're doing it with extract, it can be 40 or 50. So if you're brewing all the time, it's, um, it's kind of costly. I mean, it's still less than buying beer at the store, especially when you're getting into craft beer. But, um, you know, you're trading time essentially. So, you're, we're basically skipping an entire hour long step, which is the mash by using extract because the maltsters did our mash for us. Okay, so I'm gonna stir that in. Uh, liquid malt extract is way easier to dissolve in your water. The dried malt extract, there's a lot of stirring that goes into it. Like this is pretty much already dissolved just by getting in there. Yeah. Alrighty. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn my heat back on. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring this up to a boil. Um, when you're close to a boil, definitely watch your kettle, if you're higher than, like I don't think I'm gonna boil over here, but like you know when you make pasta and you put the lid on and then you end up with a foam explosion? It's the same principle. So there's starches in this, it'll make foam. Um, there's a thing called a hot break that we're going to experience. You guys should be able to see it on the other camera angle. And until you hit that hot break point, the foam just keeps rising. <laughs> it's a, it's an easy way to get your malt everywhere. And I have done it. If you do it, everyone does it at one point, even like commercial breweries do it. It's, 
It's just part of the process if you're not careful. You can take a spray bottle of water and just spray it if you're getting close. I like to blow it just because I'm lazy. If you end up close to getting foam everywhere, I would just cut my heat, throw some water on it, blow on it, wait it out a little bit until it's all calmed down and your foam's pretty much dissipated and then start your boil again. I It's just riding the waves of trying to boil sugar. This is a beautiful amber color right now. So this is probably gonna take at least another 10 to 20 minutes to boil. Um, the gas is typically hotter than the electric stoves that I've used in the past. So your timing is all gonna depend on what kind of heating source you're using. And uh, I've got a lot of surface area on this. If you're using a thinner pot, it'll heat a little faster because you're not, you don't have so much air touching it. Um, when you're boiling, you shouldn't cover the pot. Like I don't, I'm not covering the pot at all right now, but if you want it to heat up a little quicker, you can like crack a lid on it, but you should really remove the lid when you're boiling. There's a bunch of off flavors that you can get by leaving a tight lid on it um, because there's volatile compounds that boil off that are from the malt. Um, and if you don't let them, you can get like really bad tastes. So always keep that in mind. Yes, it will take longer to boil, but you're gonna have a better beer in the end. So an extra 10 minutes is worth it. All right, so we've got a good boil going on. Um, so now we're gonna add our hops. So we've got three different hop additions. So typically you'll add hops throughout the boil and if you're doing an IPA, sometimes in the dry hop phase or like right after you cut the boil um, in a, and it gets slightly cooler. So this one is a pretty standard ale. We're just gonna have hops in the boil, no dry hop or anything like that. Um, and we have a 60 minute edition, a 10 minute edition, and a five minute edition. And each are one ounce. And each are one ounce. So we're gonna do a 60 minute edition of one ounce of Magnum. So I've got my Magnum here, 3.5% alpha acid. That kind of corresponds to how bitter it'll be. So what I like to do is put them in a bag. Um, so I'm just gonna use the same bag that I used for my steeping grains and just toss them right in. And so this is the 60 minute edition. So this means that the hops are gonna boil for 60 minutes. That's the entire length of our boil. So we're only gonna boil this for an hour. And these will just sit in there. I'm gonna keep using the same bag. That's what's nice about having a drawstring. I'm gonna still tie it to my handle. And um, basically the bag just keeps a lot of this veg vegetal matter inside so that it's not in your fermenter and you don't have to deal with it later. You'll just pull the bag out at the end and you're done. All right, so I'm putting this in and I'm gonna set a timer for 50 minutes. At the 50 minute mark, we are going to do a few things. So we're going to add our chiller um, we're gonna add our chiller at the 50 minute mark to sanitize it. So you don't want your, to throw your chiller in right after you cut the heat and then maybe there's a bug on it or something and it's not hot enough to kill it. So you wanna boil it for about 10 minutes. We're also gonna add a Werflock tablet. Werflock tablets are basically just like the seaweed stuff that clears out your beer. So you end up with a clearer beer in the end when you use them. And we're also gonna do a hop addition. So we're doing one ounce of Cascade at the 10 minute mark. And then at the five minute mark, we're gonna do one ounce of Cascade as well. And then wait another five minutes and then cut our boil and start chilling. So I'm just gonna set my timer here. I love using my oven timer. Some people hate it, but I don't care. 
All right, so I will meet you guys back here in 50 minutes when this is all ready to go for our 10 minute edition chiller and we're flat tablet. Okay, so our timer is about up. I'm gonna toss in my chiller. So we just want this to sit at the bottom, get all sanitized and try to keep this vinyl tubing. If you have one of these without silicone tubing away from the flame, it will melt. I'm going to pop in my Werfelock tablet. I'm going to toss in my one ounce of Cascade. This is the 10 minute edition. So just throwing it in my hot bag. So I like to untie it and kind of get it Submerge. We're gonna put our timer back on for five minutes. And then we'll do our last edition. Okay, so our five minute timer just went off. I'm gonna do the same thing. And toss the five minute edition, one ounce of Cascade in the bag. Let it sink a little bit and set another timer for five minutes. Okay, so our boil is done. Um, I'm just gonna remove this hot bag. I don't think you really need to, but I'm going to take it out so that it doesn't get any more bitter than it is now. The longer the hops sit in the hot wort, the, the more bitter your beer will be. So it looks like we've got less than three gallons in here. So we'll just add three gallons of cool water to our fermenter and then put it right in once it's cooled down to less than 130 degrees. I'm gonna probably get it down to closer to 100 degrees just because, actually I'm probably gonna cool it all the way down because my tap water is warm. Very, very warm. Okay, so there was a faucet adapter with this system. Um, that's great because, you know, I'm in an upstairs apartment, teeny tiny little thing, and there's no way I can get a hose up here. There's a hose to faucet adapter that you can find at, I think you can get them at Home Depot too, um, but this one came with the kit, so if you get this kit, you'll have one. So I'm just gonna hook it up and turn my water on and you guys will be able to see it come into the chiller and then out. And I'm just hand tightening that. And honestly, I always drape a dish towel over that connection just so it doesn't spray anything, but I've got cameras in here and stuff, so you might ha not have to worry about that. So you wanna be really careful with the water that's coming out of here. This is hot. So this is, could be up to like 200 degrees, honestly, depending on the speed you're going. And one last thing, I like to cover my kettle when I'm cooling, just so nothing falls in there because it's not gonna be sanitized as soon as it gets below like 180 degrees. So we're gonna let this run for a while and then I'm gonna show you how to sanitize your fermenter and so that we can put the wort into it without causing an infection and then we can pitch our yeast. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull my chiller. I don't know exactly what temperature this is, but it's like lukewarm to the touch. So I'm gonna take this into the brewery and I'll show you guys the next steps. Okay, so the first thing we need to do with our fermenter is install the valve. So just like screws together. There's a washer on it that will seal it. So you can just hand tighten it, um, but it does involve getting your hand all the way in here. So if you're beefy, you might need to find a smaller person to help you. Just push it in. And tight. Just get it as tight as you can. And 
I like to kind of spin it and turn the valve just because it's easier to turn the valve than the actual nut. All right, so there we go. Cool. Okay. Now there's two ways to make your volume markings. There's two volume markings on these already. Um, most buckets have some volume markings as well and you can kind of see through them. So the most accurate way to make your markings other than what's labeled here already, which is only like five, six, and seven gallons, is to take something you know the volume of, put water in it, mark where the volume ends up. So I'm gonna use this mason jar. I know that up to here is half a gallon. So I'm just gonna go half gallon at a time and mark it. This is also a good way to test that you have a good seal before you add beer. Okay, so I'm just gonna mark right where the water is laying. So that's our first half gallon, and we're just gonna keep going as we fill it. Okay, so it looks like our seal is holding. So I'm just gonna drain all but a gallon of this, and then we're gonna make our sanitizer. While this is draining, I'm gonna go ahead and throw on my stick-on thermometer. So the way we're gonna make our sanitizers, we're gonna use this star sand. This stuff can get expensive if you end up doing five gallons of it at a time when you're only doing one batch. I like to make one gallon at a time, but you have to do a little bit of conversion. So the way this works is you're supposed to put one ounce per five gallons of water. So what I do is convert it into milliliters and then divide it just because it's a larger number, it's way easier than trying to figure out a fifth of an ounce. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm just gonna put in 0.2 ounces and that gives us six milliliters. So I like to use syringes, honestly. It makes it easier to get a specific ounce measurement. This stuff is super thick. Okay, so there's three. And try not to get this on your skin. It's, it is an acid. It is food safe, so you don't have to worry about the foam or anything. It's basically a no rinse sanitizer. So if there's bubbles and stuff of it left in your fermenter, it's fine. Um, it won't hurt your yeast. It doesn't do a great job of killing wild yeast either, but it does kill bacteria pretty well. Something to do about negative ions. All right, so. We've got that. I'm gonna put on my lid. It's got a gasket in here that just fell in there. <laughs> so once it's all mixed up, it's okay to get on your hands. Um, it'll dry them out a bit, but just wash your hands after and you'll be fine. I don't know how that even fell in there. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna throw in my airlock just to make it so that it can pop out less. So I'm gonna put my finger over the hole. And you just wanna let it sit in there for like 30 seconds or so. It fat happens pretty quick. I also like to put some in my valve. So I'm just gonna drain that a bit. Make sure there's nothing hiding in there. Alrighty. So it bubbles a lot. This kind of this is pretty fun. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I actually I usually use a wallpaper sprayer for my sanitizer personally. I don't typically build it in the fermenter. I'll build it in this guy. I have the measurements figured out and everything for this. So and it makes it really easy to spray it. Um, they're like 15 bucks or something and it makes it totally worth it. So I'm just gonna empty this into here since I'm gonna use it later. I'm gonna drain the rest into my bucket I've got down here. Okay, so believe it or not, we're gonna put our wort right onto these bubbles. The first thing I'm gonna do though is fill this up to the three gallon mark. So we've got a little less than three gallons in the kettle and that's like super concentrated wort. And then we need to dilute it with another three gallons to hit our original gravity. Hopefully we hit our original gravity, we'll see. Shoot it. 
there's there's really no variables happening. I sanitized this before I filled it. Um, it's just easier to fill it from my tap and bring it in here. So there's over three gallons in here, but I'm gonna fill it up to the three gallon mark in this guy, and then I'm gonna put it on the floor and we will. <clears throat> you can buy openers for these, I have one. I just don't know where it is. All right, so up to the three gallon mark. And this is filtered tap water just to get any crud out of it. Our water's weird here and my pipes are very rusty. All right, and there's three gallons exactly. And I'm gonna stick it on the floor so that we can fill from this guy. I'm gonna put this cap back on while I change the camera angle. Movie magic. So to get the wort from the kettle into the fermenter, we're gonna need to use some tubing. You could have sanitized it um, in the fermenter when we had all that going. You can also just dump your sanitizer into like a bucket or you know, a mixing bowl you have lying around um, and just toss this in, make sure to get some inside, just swirl it around, or you can use a spray bottle, which I love. You should also sanitize your valve itself. Just squirt some at it. And then you can put this right on here. This may leak. You can add a hose clamp if you desire. I don't care. All right, so I'm just gonna pull my airlock and put it right in here. I keep it above the water line because you wanna introduce oxygen into your wort. Um, it helps the yeast grow. They build their cell walls with oxygen. So before your yeast start working, oxygen is beneficial, but after you want to avoid it, it can give you a cardboard taste. So say when you're bottling, you wanna splash as little as possible. Just keep that in mind. That's also another reason the airlock is in place so that oxygen can't get back into the fermenter. So let's transfer. Look at that color. It's beautiful amber, very clear. That Werfelock really did the trick. The less your tube touches inside the fermenter, the better as well, just because if by some chance the sanitizer didn't kill something, you're not exposing it a ton. It is dark. This kettle, the valve doesn't hit all the way to the bottom, so I'm gonna tilt it down. And we got a little bit of leaking. Oh no, that's just water. So I'm gonna try to get as much out of here as I can. So we got a, a bit left. So this looks like it's gonna be a nice amber color. Some of this color will um, drop out. If you don't have a valve, you can also just dump it in there. All right, so that looks like it's about the end of it. All right, let's see how much we actually got. So we are just right above five gallons. So we boiled off a lot. That's all good. Um, so now what I'm gonna do is actually put this on top of the table so you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, so this is our wort and we need to get an original gravity reading. So I have this deal. This is just a container. I'm gonna mix this up a bit just so we can make sure we get an accurate reading. This also helps inject oxygen into the beer. So the one thing I don't like about using a hydrometer is you have to like sacrifice a little bit of beer. So you need about 250 milliliters or so. I always try to get away with as little as possible. And I'm gonna let this foam dissipate. And I'm gonna pitch my yeast now. So you wanna sanitize your yeast pack just because you don't want anything interfering with all the hard work you've done. All right open. And some people suggest you rehydrate yeast like you would baker's yeast, but I've never had a problem doing it this way. I just throw it right in. 
So dry yeast, typically you'll need only one package. Liquid yeast, you will probably need two, depending on how high ABV your beer will be. It's just the dry yeast comes with two billion cells usually and wet or liquid yeast comes with about one. I'm gonna put sanitizer up to the fill line in my airlock. This basically is gonna protect our beer from any bugs, oxygen. It's gonna keep everything out of our beer. Put the cap back on, just shove it in the hole. Okay, so one other thing you should know is you wanna keep this in the dark. Honestly, best way I've found is drape a black t-shirt over it, easy. I use my husband's. So I'm gonna go ahead and drape good old t-shirt over it. It's perfect because it's got a head hole for your the head of it. And it, they always fit like perfectly around this. All right, so this will keep our guy a little bit insulated, but mainly it'll keep it dark. And I'm just gonna stick it on my floor because it's where I ferment everything, as you can tell. Okay, so let's fill out our recipe sheet. So date brewed, it's October 26th, I think. Gallons and fermenter, we're gonna put 5.25. Time of word at pitch, or temp of word at pitch, it was around 74 degrees, it'll drop a bit. And then lag time, it says on here, is gonna be the amount of time before you see bubbles in the airlock. And then your fermentation temp will just be what it sits at. Number of days in fermenter is gonna be, I suggest leaving it in for two weeks. Um, you will probably not have any bubbles after the first week and a half or so, but you want it to level out. A lot of people, the, the only true way to tell if fermentation is done is to take another gravity reading. And once you take a few gravity readings in a row and it doesn't change, that's how you know. I don't like doing that because you lose this much beer every time. So I typically will let it go a little longer, say two and a half to three weeks, just to make sure, and then I'll bottle it. So let's see if we can get a reading. So how hydrometers work is you have liquid in there, basically measures the sugar. So you're gonna put it in there, spin it around, just to make sure there's no bubbles on it. There's a bunch of bubbles in there, so we're just gonna let it sit for the time being. It looks like we hit our gravity. I can't tell exactly what it is, but we're definitely around 1.05. So while we're waiting on this, let me explain to you how you should clean your equipment. There were some pellets, basically, that are essentially like Brewers wash, we have some powders. You can also use OxyClean free because that is actually a food safe degreaser. Um, it's, it just turns into pot ash after, so it's like like calcium and sodium or something, I don't know. Um, but especially for the fermenter, fermenter is different. You can't really scrub it, especially these PET ones. If you have a glass carboy, you can. But the stainless steel, you don't really wanna use anything abrasive in it. I like to use like pad scrubbers, but not the steel wool ones, just the plastic ones. And let it soak in hot water with some cleaner degreaser, and then just rinse it out. And that's about it. That's it. On the hot side, you don't have to worry about it being sanitized. So you don't have to do as stringent of a cleaning as you would for a fermenter. Fermenters, I like to clean fully with a degreaser and then sanitize and then seal up. The way you read a hydrometer is you read it below the meniscus point. So the water is gonna basically attach itself to the hydrometer, but you wanna read it at the lowest point. There's a few bubbles in here, but I think I can give it a reading. It's looking like 1.046 or so which is great, that's within our range. So I'm gonna put original gravity, 1.046. That'll probably get us a, a 4.6% beer. It's pretty easy to just kind of move the decimal point over and, and estimate your ABV. So that's it for the first day of brewing. 
there's more steps. Um, we're gonna basically wait for this to ferment, ferment out, and then I'll show you guys how to bottle it. Um, we're gonna do a bottle condition, which means you basically put some corn sugar in your bottling bucket, fill a bunch of bottles, cap them, and then wait another two weeks, and it'll carbonate it naturally. So this is how a lot of higher end beers are made. A lot of the beers that you see, if they have corks in them, are made this way. And typically it'll make smaller bubbles than if you force carbonate and keg it. Um, so it's, it's different, but it's nice. And it's the easiest way. You don't need a lot of equipment. All you need is 48 bottles. I'll see you guys here for bottling day. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you take up this hobby. I love it and I didn't even mean to get into it. It just kind of happened. If this was helpful, like and subscribe. I've also got a Patreon where you can get my videos early. I've got merch, happy hours, ad free videos, early videos, all the things. And there's a card up here to join. I want to thank my newest member, Eric Wicca. Thanks so much for your support. I will see you guys next time. Happy brewing. So the way you calibrate your thermometer is not even working at all. Guys, I have the worst luck with thermometers. It's insane. This doesn't even seem to drop below 100. Sometimes you'll get a dud thermometer. Cool. And this thermometer just turns a lot.